sent a smile to myself when I scrolled upon this article from the Iceland Review in my Facebook feed. Forestry Service recommends hugging trees while you can't hug others. In all seriousness, the Icelandic Forestry Service is urging its residents to hug trees in place of people in these days of social distancing. Without irony, it quotes a forest ranger enthusing about the benefits of tree hugging. When you hug a tree, you feel it first in your toes and then up your legs and into your chest and then up into your head. It's such a wonderful feeling of relaxation. And then you're ready for a new day and new challenges. Another ranger advises to take your time with your hug. Five minutes is really good, he says. If you can give yourself five minutes of your day to hug a tree, that's definitely enough. It's hard for me to imagine the mainstream U.S. press running such a story. It seems more like a headline from the satirical news site, The Onion. And yet, I smiled when I encountered the article, not because the notion of tree hugging strikes me as absurd. Rather, I smiled because I found myself doing just that hugging trees a few days earlier while walking my usual path in the woods by my house. Sheepishly, I looked around for fellow hikers, and when the coast proved clear, I wrapped my arms around a modest oak and later a stately pine. I stopped to rest on a spongy blanket of pine needles at the base of another, letting its trunk and the soft ground support my weight. As I walked, I reached out my fingertips to brush the needles of the pine saplings along my path. In short, I let the trees and the ground, the surrounding bird song and the breeze, nurture my senses and my spirit. It's actually a regular practice for me, seeking solace, comfort, and what feels to me like a certain kind of love in my connectedness to the more than human world. I didn't always do this. I wasn't an outdoorsy type as a kid. We didn't hike or camp or take long bike rides together as a family, and that was fine with me. I preferred to read and to play indoors and decidedly human-centered games like make-believe house and school, dolls and dress up. As a young adult, I grew to enjoy hiking, bird watching, and canoeing with my husband Dave, but it wasn't until recently, during these seminary days, that I have come to appreciate the way the non-human aspects of nature offer a kind of nurturance and comfort that bring me to a sustaining awareness of my fundamental belonging in the world. It all started one late afternoon during a week of summer intensive classes at Meadville. I'm not sure what set me off, but I was hit by a wave of insecurity, a feeling that I did not fit in there, did not belong, was not wanted or valued by my peers. The social landscape of seminary can feel a bit like middle school, and I was having a middle school kind of bad day. To ward off tears, I removed myself from the high-rise building in downtown Chicago where we met for classes. Without conscious intention, I found myself en route to the lake. Once at its edge, the beat of my heart began to steady in rhythmic kinship with the lapping of the waves against the shore. I felt the warmth of the sun on my arms and then the gentle stroke of the warm breeze on my face once and again and again, like the touch of a parent consoling a small child. It didn't matter in that moment 
whether I belonged among my seminary peers because I belonged to this earth. This universe was born to it and of it, equipped with senses designed to perceive and receive its gifts of comfort and joy. That day taught me that when human relationships and human community are fraught with fear, anxiety, risk, and tension, I can come into the peace of wild things. As Wendell Berry says in his beloved poem, one that is striking a nerve in these times, when despair grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax themselves with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting for their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. In the face of the tremendous anxieties, fears, and pressures brought on by this global human pandemic, I still find peace in the knowledge of my belonging to a universe so much greater than the human world, greater even than human time. It doesn't make the anxiety go away, but it helps to sustain me through it. I rest in the grace of the world and am free. And so I find myself turning more and more to the woods and to the non-human forms of nature outside my windows. I've been enchanted by a family of foxes that have taken up residence in a brush-filled lot next door to my house. Dave and I were charmed by one who made an appearance beneath our window the morning after a late season snowfall. We were less charmed when that same fox kept us awake in the middle of the night with its incessant shriek until we discovered that it was likely protecting a litter of sweet kits. As my human neighbors keep their distance, I've suctioned a bird feeder to a window in my living room to invite the neighboring songbirds to come in close. It feels so good to be able to offer someone hospitality and in return to receive the gifts of their sweet songs and colorful beauty, gold and purple finches, red cardinals, black capped chickadees. In the absence of professional sports, they entertain us with their antics as they compete to stake their claim on a banquet of sunflower seed. What about you? Where do you, where might you, come into the peace of wild things? What's outside your window, whether urban, rural, or somewhere in the middle? What forms of non-human nature bring you comfort, pleasure, wonder, delight, a brisk breeze or a gentle one, plump white clouds in a blue sky, a gentle rain, the warm sun on your shoulders, the glisten of freshly fallen snow in the tree branches, maybe the shenanigans of songbirds, pigeons, or squirrels, the flowers that grow wildly, perhaps unexpectedly between the sidewalk cracks, or those cultivated in garden beds and pots, your own beloved pet. One hope I am harboring in these frightening times is that we will emerge more attuned and grateful for the bounty of gifts the earth gives to nourish not only our bodies but also our hearts and spirits. I hope, too, that the love we receive will inspire a far greater love in return that we may give the gifts of humanity in the service of the earth's flourishing for ourselves and for all of our neighbors, whether furry, feathered, or otherwise adorned. May it be so. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11 states, When I was a child, I spoke like a child, 
I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. So ends the reading. Let that end be in the ways that teach us that our selfish wants as individuals should not come at the cost of the community. Let that end not be in how we marvel at the breeze on our face and the vastness of trees. See, in 1 Corinthians chapters 13, it speaks of love. The chapter is about learning to love in a way that enhances the whole. It's about learning to love something grander than the self. Of course, many people interpret that text that the Apostle Paul wrote as a way to teach humans to love God and or Jesus and about how God loves them. I interpret it as an ancient text that we can utilize to teach us how to care for the community of the natural world. Paul goes on to write, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I only know in part, then I will know fully, even as I've been fully known. Paul addresses how we create, not fully knowing what the shape of our creation will be, that we make choices, not fully knowing the impact that they will have in the future. That fits definitively into the category of no lies detected. How often have you made the best, most well-researched decision and still been surprised by the outcome? That is a part of being human. I remember when I was young, I was told by, I'm sure, a much older and wiser sibling, that if you cut a worm in half, it will grow into two worms. By the way, that isn't exactly true. I made it my job to dig out and cut all the worms in my mother's garden so that she could have more help. My decision to cut the worms was based on sound information. Yet, she had fewer worms. Definitely not the outcome I was seeking. One thing I did learn in her garden was that the earth is beautiful, that the grubs in the ground have a job even when we don't want them in our gardens, and that so do the worms, that the flowers are as beautiful as the weeds, are as beautiful as the fruit, are as beautiful as the vegetables. The earth is gorgeous and it has its own smell. Something that innately lets me know it is okay to breathe deeply. It is okay to be held. When my hands are deep in the earth, there's a calmness there and a vibrancy there that I don't feel anywhere else. I know that there are places that putting your hands in the dirt just aren't possible. That our dirt has been flattened and covered with concrete. And I know that there are places that there's nothing but dirt. Either way, there is a way that we can connect to the earth. Whether there is concrete on top of your earth or earth covering everything, the earth will hold you. We plant our feet or our bodies or our minds or our hands and we can touch the earth and the earth will hold you. It will hold you steady it will remind you that you are of the earth. It will keep you. It will keep you together. <sighs> there is love in the earth. And the last part of the text says in chapter 13, now faith, hope, love abide. These three and the greatest of these is love. 
And the greatest of these is love. And we know that love conquers many things. The greatest of these is love. Love when we are all separated from human touch. Yet that there is green there, outside, just outside, just right out there. Even if there is concrete covering everything, there is a weed somewhere, and that weed is earth. Just right outside, there is a tree there waiting for you to touch it. Right outside, there may be grass or dandelions. There could be kudzu or thorns just right outside all earth waiting for you. I hope that we will continue to see the beauty of the earth. I know that love is tangible and intangible in ways that we can't imagine. And I trust that the earth will hold me and the earth will hold you. Now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, the greatest of these is love. May it be so. Ashe, blessed, blessed be.